<laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Free. I'm the deputy director at the NASA Glenn Research Center, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here today, and I'll, I'll be moderating our event. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to celebrate the 50th anniversary of uh, Senator Glenn's historic space flight when he became the first American to orbit the Earth. We are pleased also to have us uh, with, him, with, us, with us here today because he's an Ohio native, uh, he's a Marine, and uh, uh, he also served this state so well for us as our Senator. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Senator Glenn. Also on our panel today is uh, Major General Charles Bolden, the uh, NASA Administrator, a uh, distinguished career in the Marine Corps and a shuttle astronaut. Please welcome Charles. Here. Thank you. And then the third member of our panel, uh, he was able to say it all day that his boss, now I'm introducing my boss, <laughs> uh, distinguished NASA career at the uh, Kennedy Space Center and at Glenn. Uh, please welcome Senator Dr. Ray Lugo. Okay, we're going to start today with an opening statement from Senator Glenn. Um, but before we do that, I also want to recognize a person who I had the uh, pleasure of spending a great deal of time with today, uh, Annie Glenn. Doctor, doctor. So, Senator Glenn. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, commemorative days are fun to look back and, and remember what happened back at a certain time, but I think they're, they're useful mainly as a stepping stone to looking forward. And we can see what strides were made in the past by whatever people and whatever whoever happened to come along at that time, but I think they give us an insight maybe into what we can do in the future, and that's the importance of a commemorative day like this. Uh, hard for me to believe it's been 50 years uh, since that first orbital flight back then. It seems like just a couple of weeks to me. But uh, it, it is uh, important, I think, to look back, not that I am looking for celebrations or anything like that, but it's good to look back uh, and, and think about where we may go in the future. Can we make some of those same strides in the future we've made in the past? That's the importance of NASA, is uh, it's leading the way in that area of research with the International Space Station and all the other uh, research that is carried on within NASA at the different uh, centers, including the one that Ray has here, right here in Cleveland. And uh, so those, that's the important thing of, of looking back. The past is prologue, as somebody said. And uh, if we can use the past and as to uh, keep our interest going, particularly among young people. Uh, I'm sure that Annie and I are probably the oldest people in the room here. And we're maybe, uh, most of you here would be about a third of our age, uh, literally. But uh, the important part is that uh, as you look back now, the important thing is for you to look forward on what you can do in your own lifetime and set your own goals. And uh, that's the important thing of having a, a commemoration like this to me. So uh, I welcome the opportunity to be here and get whatever questions you may have in a little bit. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Glenn. Um, Let's see, we're going to start with uh, the media first, and we'll do a few que no, media questions, and then we'll uh, have our, our tweeters start their questions. There's uh, question, uh, microphones on uh, either side of the room, so please uh, raise your hand, and when you get the microphone, state your affiliation, and uh, then begin with your question. So questions from the media? Go right to the tweeters. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have one right here. Hi. Uh, Kevin Kelly with Westlife Newspaper. Uh, Senator Glenn, uh, will it, would it bother you if, and should it bother the American people if uh, in the future the rockets that NASA uses to launch NASA's astronauts are owned by the private sector and private in industry rather than NASA itself? No, not at all because, they, you know, this isn't something brand new. Uh, NASA never had any factories of their own in the past. They always contracted with uh, some of the contractors, and now the contractors are taking a, a new role a little earlier in the process uh, than they did before, just when NASA put out a, a request for an RFP, a request for proposal, and uh, then got the actions in. Actually, they're, they're, it's more competition among the uh, different companies uh, earlier in the process. And uh, Charlie's the one who 
has devised a lot of this and is, uh, uh, is running it right now. And uh, Steve Lindsay that I was on the second flight with is with one of those companies now. Where's Steve? He's, he's, he's right here. there. Over here, yeah. Steve is with one of those companies now. So it's good representation here. And Charlie, that's one that you ought to take. So uh, I'm like him. I think it's going to be great. And, and as the senator says, when he came in, they spent a lot of time out in Downey, California or other places helping the contractors to build the vehicle, specifying that, okay, it's got to have windows. Uh, the biggest difference now is that we're not going to own the vehicle. It will be owned by the, the private company, and, and we still have to decide whether it's going to be a taxi or it's going to be a rental car, uh, but, but that will be the only difference. The big thing for the United States, for the government, is that we don't have to pay for the operation and maintenance. Uh, we're going to be really busy. Senator Glenn emphasizes, as he should, the critical importance of the International Space Station. That's why we need the private companies to give us the capability of taking people and things to the International Space Station because we can't do the exploration we want to do without a viable International Space Station. So that's, that's what we're focused on trying to do. The importance of this too now is that we don't have a way of, of getting on our own in this country. We have no way of getting to our International Space Station on our own. We have to contract with the Russians. We send our astronauts over there. They're launched from Russia. They come back to, to Russia and then come back to this country. And uh, that's a result of some of the decisions that were made in the previous administration, which I think were wrong, 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 but uh, uh, that's my view. And what it did was cut out the shuttle to help pay for these things, uh, was the, the theory. And so it means now that if something happened to the Soyuz, we'd have no means of getting back and forth to, to the station at all. And so the importance of what Steve is doing and other companies that uh, that are in competition with his company are uh, the importance of them getting on stream with vehicles and boosters rapidly is very, very important. So we get our own means of getting on with the research that the space station was built to do. We, we spent over $100 billion building that station and getting it up there. It wasn't just to see if we could accomplish an engineering feat, it was to do basic fundamental research. And Charlie's got the thing crammed full of what kind of research we can do now, but we can do so much more if we have our own transportation system back and forth. Okay, next question. Okay, uh, we'll go on to uh, the folks who have their Twitter accounts up and active. <laughs> Why did you decide to take the risk? Can't hear you there. Why did you decide to take the risk? Which time? <laughs> First time. First time. I, I was a military uh, fighter pilot. I was in the Marine Corps as a fighter pilot. Uh, it was, uh, you looked at it as an assignment, uh, like you're almost going into combat. We knew there were some dangers. But we wanted to minimize those dangers, and we did uh, in working with the manufacturers and with our own training to minimize those dangers as much as we possibly could. And uh, it was important for the country. Those were the depths of the Cold War days. Uh, Cold War may be ancient history to you. You may want to go back and, and get on your computer <laughs> and uh, read a little bit about the Cold War. It was a real competition between our country and, and communism and whether it was going to be the wave of the future around the world or not. And so we thought it was important for the country. And, uh, and so the, uh, were there some dangers? Yeah, we, we knew that, but we thought we had them minimized. Uh, and I don't think, you know, just looking to the future, uh, space travel will never be 100% safe. Any more than if you go out here and get in an automobile, it's not 100% safe that uh, you're not gonna have an accident someplace. Uh, and we have accidents every day. Uh, out on the highways, but uh, we try and minimize those, and we try and minimize them in, in space travel also, and, and uh, we've done a pretty good job of that, I think. We've had a couple of, of times when uh, there were problems, the Columbia accident that, where the spacecraft and the crew were destroyed, but uh, those have been minimal, and we, uh, we hope that those days never happen again. We just have to keep working for as much safety as possible. Okay, next, uh, right here. Hi, my name's Alicia. Hold on a second. Well, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Alicia Hall, 
that you're on TV. Hi, my name is Alicia Hansen. Um, first, on behalf of the Cleveland Twitter community and social media community, I want to thank the Tweet Up folks for doing this because this really means a lot to all of us that have an active part in the online community here. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm a proud NASA wife, and I am um, very proud of my husband, Hans. And um, what advice, perhaps, would you have for him as a young NASA employee, sort of, you know, how to really embrace his passions for space, for engineering, and going forth? Yeah. Because I'm so proud, I just want to see him to continue to do great things. If you don't mind, I'd, I'll tell you, the first thing you need to do is keep encouraging him. If you noticed, uh, Senator Glenn's wife, she's at his side all the time. So just keep encouraging him, and then I'll let the boss tell you what you can do uh, or what he should look forward to. No, I, Annie, what should she do? He do. <laughs> I, 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 what you're doing is really important. And I, it, obviously, he's done what we've asked him to do, which is we always tell NASA employees to be incredibly proud of what you do. Uh, we make a difference in people's lives every single day. And uh, anytime I come, like when I came to Glenn a couple of weeks ago, uh, the message I left them with was I want you to go home at the end of the day every day understanding that you are making a difference in people's lives. When John flew, I don't think he had any idea the impact that he was going to have on the world. Uh, but he did it. And the reason he keeps beating us about making sure that we, that we fully utilize the International Space Station is because right now that's the main vehicle that allows us to bring benefits back to humanity. That's right. I mean, it's doing incredible things and we just don't, we're not, we're not telling our story very well, unfortunately, but we're, we're working on it. Well, we hope you have a long and happy married life and you will as long as he just keeps saying yes. <laughs> Is over. I think the tweet okay. up is over with that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Great. Uh, Senator, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about tourism through space? What's about your name what? and age? I'm sorry. Uh, Teddy Glenn, sir, and I'm 13. Glenn? <laughs> oh, Glenson. Yeah. Okay, and 13. What was the now, question again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about tourism in space? Tourism in space. I think it'll come sometime. I think it's so expensive right now, it's going to be prohibitive for most people. You know, they, they're letting people go up into space where you technically become an astronaut and that you go beyond 100 uh, miles in space, 60, uh, 62 and a half miles, I'm sorry, 100 kilometers in space, and back down again. You're up there above that level by about four or five minutes, something like that. Mm -hmm. And people are uh, lining up, to, as I understand it, to pay $200,000 for a ticket to do that. A little more not pay, but that's the way she goes. <laughs> but the uh, uh, tourism in space, I think, will come, and probably, in my view, uh, after we get some better propulsion system that's cheaper than the one we have now. Right now, to load one of these things up with all the fuel you have to have, and uh, or the mechanisms of taking it first on an airplane and launching it then from there, or, or whatever, that that's a long, that's quite a, an expensive process. But if you have a new energy source one of these days, and it'll come, uh, just like in the past, we've had animal power, steam power, railroads, uh, uh, gasoline engines, steam power, uh, rockets, and so on. Uh, we'll have some other uh, propulsion system someday. And when we do and it becomes cheaper, then I think uh, people will go up, and I, I hope you make it, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay. Right. Going. Senator Glenn, I'm a little closer to your demographic, I think, than the other uh, two-thirds here. <laughs> well, you, I, you and I are using the same barber. I can see that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Schick. This represents NASA Plumbrook Station, which yeah. is just west of here. And I uh, want to thank NASA for, that's where my school district is. I've spent 30 years in education. Good for we you. applied for a STEM grant as a school. You talked about creativity. You talked about energy research. What do you say to the young people? Back in the 50s when the Cold War was going on, and I'm a former history teacher, do we have that same threat today to get people involved in STEM? And what do you say to young people to get them involved? We don't have the same, uh, uh, the same reason for getting in as we had during the Cold War. But I think the reason for getting into STEM today is every bit as important as it was during the Cold War. 
Now this country got to be what it is, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, got to be what it is by uh, better educating our people, particularly in the area of the sciences, and, the, and doing more research. And I think the, uh, uh, we learned the new things first, and with that educated citizenry, wow, we just uh, stepped ahead of the rest of the world in a fairly short period of time. Uh, you can't, uh, uh, I think that's the important thing right now is keeping our young people involved with it because other nations are, they've seen what the goose was that laid the golden eggs in this country and they're now out competing us in education, in STEM in particular. And there's study after study, I did one of them, I took about a year on it back just when I was leaving the Senate. Secretary of Education asked me to head up a commission, which I did for a year and we had a wonderful commission. and. Uh, it showed that our kids up to about the fourth, uh, this was done in 41 nations over three years, and showed that our kids up to about the fourth grade have the best concept or better concept of, of uh, science and technology and math and so on than most kids, than the, than the kids that were studying in these 41 nations. By the time our kids get out of high school, we're two or three from the bottom. And it's gotten worse instead of better in the last 10 years since that study was made. So uh, the, the reason why it's important, I think it, it's every bit as important for our country, although there's a different reason why, it's that we're under more competition now from other sources than we have been, and we better shape up. Fortunately, we have a better higher education system than any other nation in the world, and we're the envy of the rest of the world in that area. And that'll do us for a little while, but uh, there's no guarantee that without uh, good understanding of STEM by our young people and, and willingness to get in and, and really be active in that area and get a good education, no, no guarantee that we'll be number one 50 or 75 years from now. So I think it's just as important now that uh, we get this, the STEM students out there and encourage them as it was back in the, the Cold War days. That's a long answer to your short question. Yeah, I'd add one other thing. I, was, um, I grew up during the Cold War and it was a different kind of a war then. It was more about, you know, uh, assured mutual destruction. We're fighting a different kind of a Cold War. It's an economic That's Cold true. War now. And um, while we're doing good research to support NASA missions at NASA Glenn, I think federal labs like NASA Glenn need to do more to get the technologies we're working out on into commercial application. And so that's one of the things we've been doing at NASA Glenn, working with a lot of private companies across the U.S., including uh, uh, Colonel Lindsay's company, to not only get the technology but the testing capabilities that we have into the hands of people who um, could potentially uh, create economic activity, create jobs. So I think. Um, what we do at NASA has the potential to help us win the next Cold War. Okay, over there. Hello, um, hello my name is Andy Oriel. I'm a newspaper reporter at the Sandusky Register. I cover the NASA Plumbrook Station. Senator Glenn, thanks for your time. Um, I want to know, was there any personal items that you wanted to take up into space? And when you were up in space, maybe other than your wife, what was something that you really missed most on Earth? I'm glad you had a wife first on that. You that. <laughs> no, what, uh, you mean what uh, kind of things I took into space? What, what personal items you absolutely couldn't be without while in space, something that you brought up, and then oh. something that you wished you, you could have had, like a piece of pizza or, you know, tang or something <laughs> like that, I don't know. So. Forget the tang. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, no, I think, you know, you're, you're pretty well supplied with everything you need up there when you get ready to go. And, and, uh, and NASA, you don't go down to the grocery store and shop to take food along with you. Uh, NASA supplies all of that, and that was it. We, I took some little mementos for my kids and things like that that I brought back, and that they have uh, as mementos of the flight and some things like that. But uh, as far as uh, other things, you're, you're, pretty, uh, you're pretty limited in the uh, uh, weight of things you can take. And, uh, and you're up there to do basic research. You're up there to do, a, you're, you're up there to work. And you don't have a lot of time for, uh, for uh, other things and extraneous matters. And, and uh, I think on the flight I was on with, with Steve last, we had about a, maybe 20 minutes or a half hour before we'd put the stops on the windows and declare it's now nighttime uh, because you have to create your own night and day up there. Uh, and we had about 20 minutes to a half hour in which we'd fiddle around and play with water balls. You know, you can put a, 
a little water ball out here in front of you like this and, and blow on it and it'll, you can drive it back and forth and it'll just float out here in front of you and little things like that. But there wasn't much time to do, to, to play things like that. Uh, mo most of the time up there is very well planned for every single astronaut and you have the, the timeline for every single astronaut, what you're doing minute by minute. And so it's not a time period, not a, not a time up there when you have a lot of other uh, time for other things is what I'm trying to say. Okay, well I want to thank uh, Senator Glenn, Charlie, and Ray for their time today and for all of you uh, to be here. I'd ask that you uh, stay seated till uh, uh, they leave the podium. Thank this, you. This is my first tweet on. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to begin the next part of our uh, program here, and uh, let me uh, introduce our, uh, our our next four guests. Um, we have uh, we're going to make you an honorary Ohio astronaut here today, Steve. Since I you joined the I lived for 18 panel. months in Ohio. Oh, there you go. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. We'll see this might. We, we won't look at the tax records for that. Um, <laughs> no, really, it is. The date. I believe you. So uh, let me first introduce uh, Colonel Steve Lindsay, who uh, was introduced earlier today, and uh, you know, a veteran of five uh, shuttle flights, uh, Air Force uh, test pilot, and uh, head of the crew office. I, I always thought it was great, Steve. You always had to get off the Astro van there to go fly the STA yeah. on approaches uh, before uh, before a launch. So that was always I remember you getting off that van. Let me next introduce uh, uh, Greg Johnson, Greg Box Johnson. I, and nobody else has a nickname on here. How do you get the only guy to get a nickname? Also, uh, a veteran of uh, two flights, uh, the pilot on STS-123, which he flew with Mike Foreman, and the pilot on uh, Endeavour's final flight, STS-134, in May of last year. Um, let me uh, next introduce Mike Good, another Ohio astronaut from Broadview Heights. Mike is a veteran also of two uh, shuttle flights, STS-125, the uh, uh, Hubble, last Hubble servicing mission, the, uh, uh, and then STS-132 to ISS, uh, also a Air Force uh, pilot, colonel in the Air Force. And then finally, uh, Captain Mike Foreman from Wadsworth, uh, veteran of uh, two shuttle flights. And uh, what I'd like to do is give them, if they'd like, a chance to uh, make a couple remarks, and then we'll open it up for questions. Steve? Thanks. It's uh, it's good to be here. As I mentioned, I uh, when I got got called, actually Box called me, and and uh, he must have run out of anybody important because he finally got desperate and called me and said, "Hey, Steve, could you come talk?" And uh, so, but but it's a real honor for me to come here and uh, and get a chance to talk a little bit about John, share a few uh, about John, share a few of my memories of uh, of working with John over the years. I've known him for a long time now, and. Uh, you know, it's easy to talk about John because, uh, as I mentioned in my in my remarks, is what you see is what you get, and and he's uh, he's just a wonderful person, both he and Annie, and so it's a real privilege for me to be up here today just to to, to try to share a few memories and uh, and and honor John like he should be honored. I just want to welcome uh, you all to our first tweet up. So here's for you. But you know what, uh, uh, Senator Glenn, I was, I was, he, he was, he shot his uh, first flight when I was born. And uh, so I've been coming along with him as he gets his 30th anniversary, I turned 30. He is his 40th anniversary, I turned 40. Well, guess what? This year I turned 50. <laughs> okay, so. You, you look 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But, but I was really Feel excited. Feel to jump you know. in, Jim. If oh, you yeah, need to yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. But uh, I have to say that I'm so pleased. I feel like we're sitting here with, with part of our family that we've been, uh, been with for uh, over the last decade, and I'm just so pleased that these guys came up uh, to join in this uh, event with us. 
Um, you know, we, we uh, two months, which is not a lot of time, and uh, everybody came together, all the people that work at the Glen Research Center, we have been working hard together to pull this off, and thank you to everybody at the Glen Research Center who contributed to this event, and to Cleveland State, because they were a, a great partner as well. But anyway, I'm not going to get long-winded. I'll, I'll uh, introduce Mike, Sorry, one of the late. two Mikes. <laughs> that's Mike, and that's Bueno, just so you know who they are. Well, it's great, it's great to be here. This is also my first uh, tweet on. <laughs> uh, I, I will say I've, I've had a Twitter account for a little over a week. I think I, I have three followers, and, uh, you know, yeah, you know. How many, how many people in the audience have 1,000 followers? Wow, 2,000? Wow. 3,000? Amazing, wow. It's mostly spam bots. I don't know what you just said, but. Uh, You've been trying to get more Twitter handles. Can you just let us know who you are? Yeah. 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 I'm trying not to get followers because, <laughs> frankly, frankly I, I joined Twitter so that I could follow my daughter because uh, day in and day out, my wife looks at her Blackberry and, and she says, our, our daughter just tweeted again and, you know, she's, I got to get on all this. So I, 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 I found out, you know, I can't just follow her. I have to have a Twitter account to follow her. So I don't know if you guys knew that, but, but yeah, I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the Twitter ex expert. Uh, so that's, that's why I did it. So, um. You, you wouldn't be very exciting to follow me because I'm not planning to do a lot of tweeting. Although I did tweet something, you know, while, while we were sitting in there because I said, here's my boyhood hero, John Glenn. I'm getting here to, you know, sit here and talk, and that's pretty cool. So Yeah, I got that one. You got that one? <laughs> <laughs> I have four followers now. Yeah. I was, I, I dropped out, so I think you're back down to three uh, <laughs> after, after that. Um, but it, it is pretty cool to be here today and to be a part of this uh, historic, you know, remembrance and honoring John Glenn. You know, as, as Charlie said in his remarks, John Glenn, he was a, sp a space pioneer. You know, it was his service and dedication that allowed us to all go fly in space. You know, we got to go orbit, but we didn't get to go orbit and fly in space, you know, until John did. And so hopefully, but we're not. We're not the last, you know, so there's going to be, that's why part of our job is to inspire others to uh, not just, you know, fly in space, but to learn more about science and uh, technology, math, these kinds of things. These are important, and you heard uh, the senator talk about those. So um, thanks to John Glenn for his service and for his dedication to what he did and to allow us to be able to go fly in space and to go chase our dreams. That was my dream was to go fly in space and to, and to get to do a spacewalk, float over to the Hubble Space Telescope and open up the doors and actually crawl inside of that thing and, and get to use power tools in space. I mean, <laughs> how, how cool is that? So, uh, no kidding. Um, thanks, Jim. Back to you. Your, thank, your job is to you keep us in the Yeah, <laughs> keep us focused. That's the thing I've been sweating about all day is trying to control. <laughs> Trying to thank God Steve came up here because there's some sanity now with you. Not sir. really. Uh, we'll open it up to questions from the media first. Any questions there? Okay. How about all the new followers of Foreman? <laughs> <laughs> I won't give it away. Go ahead. Uh, it's right there, right? The gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi, guys. I'm Andrew Cal from Atlanta. More than anything, I just want to say thank you. Uh, my life has been much more rich and full, uh, being inspired by what all, all you guys do. You know, living a life of science and engineering. I earned my pilot's license. I continue to pursue that. And really, part of that is, is watching what, what you guys have done and previous guys have done and, and making it possible for the rest of us. So that's really all to say. It's just thanks for, for making my life better. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's say... Uh, you know, all four of us have spent some time in Ohio, and uh, people always ask me, why are there so many astronauts from Ohio? 
I always say, well, just a lot of people looking for work outside the state. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, the truth, the truth is, and, and you've kind of picked up on this already uh, from Mike's comments, uh, you know, we were all inspired in this state by John Glenn because, you know, um, in any state, we were at the ripe age, you know, to, to kind of take that all in and get inspired by John Glenn, and that's, that's the reason we're doing this. So um, thank you for your comment. Next, right here. We learn about all the horrendous medical things they made the early astronauts do to get them ready, and how he insisted there had to be a window, and how he went out and just bought a camera off the shelf to take pictures because he was brilliant enough to realize someone wanted a picture from space. So, how do you compare your training program to what he went through over 50 years ago? I'll start off. Um, it is true uh, that uh, now we've had over 500 uh, astronauts and cosmonauts uh, are officially, have officially flown in space. And so we've had um, obviously a lot more practice uh, figuring out how to work and uh, live in orbit. And, uh, but, but still, uh, the, the adventure and the wonder of being weightless is such a surprise on your first flight. And I have to say, my first flight, I really wasn't prepared because I really didn't know what, what to expect. I was prepared for training, but I was not prepared for all the other things that you just can't practice on the, on the planet. And so uh, we've gotten better at it, but there's still a big learning curve on your first flight. Now, Steve's flown five times, so he can uh, probably have further words. Well, I mean, uh, I think you, you asked, you know, what's the difference in, in the training or, or what they did? You know, when, if you talk to John, when they all came in for the Mercury program, they didn't know anything about space. They didn't know how it was going to react. And depending on who you talk to, you know, um, you probably mentioned a few of those things today. They didn't see it all, which, by the way, is partially true. Um, and uh, they uh, said, you know, you couldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to swallow, you'd be so disoriented and so scared that you wouldn't be able to function. I mean, all, all this unknown. And so for the, for the doctors at the time, they didn't know what to do, so they just did everything they could think of. And uh, I don't know if you watched the video, but, uh, but uh, they were showing that spinning chair, that thing spun in three axis, and John was telling me for his graduation exercise out of that, I think they spun it up at 100 degrees per second in all three axis. And then he had to manually control it and get it to a stop in three axes and 100 degrees per second. We've done a lot of work on orbit flying vehicles, and we can all tell you that stopping something spinning at that speed when you're spinning in it is really hard. Well, we, didn't, we don't do that kind of thing because we, hopefully we learned from that and said this is really unnecessary. And so, <laughs> so our, uh, our medical, you know, we, we do medical testing, and, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is uh, for these young guys. I call them young guys because they're younger than me. You know, a lot, of, a lot of it we did intentionally just kind of to torture them. <laughs> okay, in the back right there. Hi, my name is Bess Reynolds from Houston, Texas, and what I'd like to know is what can we do as citizens to convince our government, other than writing our legislators, that we believe that science is extremely important, <coughs> that NASA needs more funding, and that it will lead to more jobs if you simply educate people, give them opportunities, spend the money, any ideas? I mean, besides tweeting, you know? <laughs> you want me to answer this one? Yeah, let, let Mike answer. Yeah. Mike, Mike can answer. Mike, uh, <laughs> good. Mike Good is brilliant. He was going to answer this for us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. But, uh, no, that, that's a, it's a brilliant question. I, I don't think I have a brilliant answer. I think if I did, uh, we'd be doing it. But I think this is, this is part of it. I mean, part of our jobs are to, uh, you know, go out and uh, we're, our mission is to explore space, but then it's to bring it back. Paid for it, you know. Um, we all work for the government. And uh, so we thank and, and uh, letting us, you know, go ride rockets and, and go explore uh, space. Um, I mean, you're, you're right on. I don't know how to, to deliver that message any better. Um, but I think we, we all just need to continue doing that. I mean, you say, other than write your congressman, that's one step. That's one thing to do. It's one thing to let them know that, hey, this is important to us, and we think uh, you need to uh, 
carry this fight to Washington, and, and you've got to fund it. I mean, Senator Glenn mentioned it, it several times that, you know, NASA's on a fixed budget, and we're actually pretty lucky in these times that we've, we've kept a, a, a flat budget even. We haven't taken deep cuts, but we're being asked to do so many things, and so um, that's why we had to really eliminate the space shuttle program so that we could use that money to, to start, exp you know, other programs, uh, a, you know, a new space capsule and a new rocket so that we can go outside of low Earth orbit and go out to the, you know, moon, to asteroids, out to Mars. That's where we want to go. We want to explore out further. And that's why Steve and some of these uh, commercial companies are going to help us get back and forth to the International Space Station. And uh, that allows us, NASA, to explore out further. Um, anything to add, Steve? Yeah, let me add a little something. I Honestly, I don't understand it. It, it. it seems it seems intuitively obvious to me that if you look at the history of our nation, particularly in the 20th century, where we came of age and we became the most powerful nation on the earth, it was because of what we did in technology. You pick the industry, we did it. We invested in it. We spent the time in it and the money. We invest in universities like this university right here to do research, because when you invest fundamentally invest in things like research, you can try a thousand things and 999 of them might fail, but that's okay because one of them is going to succeed and it's going to change the world. In the space world, it's the same thing. You know, our, our nation invests in the space program. Um, if you look at the whole uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo program, it was about a Cold War race to beat the, beat the Soviets to the moon. I mean, that's what it was all about. It was all about the Cold War. But look what came out of it wasn't the Cold War. What came out of it was was completely changing your life. I mean, you can't look at all the Twitter stuff that's going on here, all the electronic devices you're using, it all came out of the space program. And, 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 it's, and it sits right in front of us. And I don't know how to convince people that we have to invest in math and science. We have to excite our children in math and science because it's so important. And, and by the way, it's also really cool. It's a lot of fun. We're all in math and science. The reason I became an astronaut was not so I could uh, be stand, you know, sitting up here and, uh, and be in front of the media, because that's not my favorite thing to do. The reason I became it is because I wanted, I wanted to be able to do math and science. I wanted to be able to apply what I learned. I wanted to explore new things and learn new things. And, and it's, it's, what, it's what's made our country strong. It will continue to make our country strong. And it will make our country weak if we don't. So I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to convince people of that, but it seems intuitively obvious to me. I think what we can do, NASA can do, is to, to get the message out better. I think Charlie alluded it, to it earlier in his comments. You know, we, NASA, need to um, take advantage of as many opportunities as we can, like Twitter and, and anything that we can do to get the message out that what, what's going on at NASA. I think we as astronauts have always thought, you know, if the, if the people in, in the United States knew all of the great things that NASA does, you know, they would really be impressed, you know, so we just need to keep working at that. That's not something that you can do, but, but we can work on that. Okay, right here. Yes. Uh, first off, my name is Dane TH Rex. I wanted to take a moment to thank you, NASA, for supporting the Tweet Up events, uh, both personally and, and, and a, on a programmatic basis. Uh, in terms of a moment of levity, uh, we have several civilian spacecraft coming up. Just by show of hands, you know, if something is ready in the next two or three years for a manned man space flight that comes from the civilian sector. <laughs> what is the question? What was the question? I would, and, I, I would jump on. I didn't even sure. wait and, for the question. The, I assume the question was who, is, who wants to jump exactly. on? Exactly. I'm in. And among the tweets <laughs> that happen to be in the room? Yeah. <laughs> you Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> okay, back there. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you on behalf of everybody here. Um, so my name is Stuart Smith. I'm in the Cleveland area, very active in the social media, so we're all very excited to be here today. Uh, I remember as a youth um, being active in scouting, and I would go to a National Scout Jamboree and hear about the future of the space shuttle. And it really got me excited. And this, they were showing me models and everything. So I was really shocked when I saw the space shuttle discontinued. So if you could give me a little bit so I can share with others, what is the vision? Because um, for me, and you know, again, I'm not as involved as a lot of the people here that go to a lot of your more NASA events. So what is the vision for this rocket system that's coming up? And um, is that the definite path? And is it a USA path? Thank you. I'll start to answer that. 
Well, you know, like any transportation system, and you heard uh, Senator Glenn uh, mention this, uh, as well as Charlie, that uh, as we uh, progress in a transportation system, airplanes were no different. I mean, airplanes started off uh, 100 years ago, very, very rudimentary airplanes. And then uh, we built on that, and, and there was a big propulsion breakthrough when the jet engine w was uh, invented. And then all of a sudden, today, we fly airplanes uh, coast to coast. It's, it's a commonplace thing. And space is no different. It's going to be an evolution. And we're going to go from vehicle to vehicle, and we're going to stand on the shoulders of the previous vehicle. And so to enable the, the funds and to recognize that the shuttle was a mainstay of our space program for many, many years and has done many great things, we want to invest in the next step. And so what is that step? Well, there's lots of things to do. We want to get to the space station first. But we also want to go outside of the low Earth orbit. We want to get to the moon and eventually to Mars and out of the solar system. Now, to do that, we're going to need a new propulsion system, which goes back on the, uh, on the uh, point of getting our kids energized. Somebody out there is going to come up with that new idea that's going to get us that incremental breakthrough, just boom, right past uh, the, uh, the, the technology that we've got today and get us to, to places far uh, away from our Earth. I don't, know if you, I don't know if your question was specifically like, what's, what's NASA's plan? What's next for NASA? He's specific. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> no. Box, that was, that was brilliant. That was right on. Um, I think Very eloquent. The, uh, I, I tried to talk about it a little bit before. What NASA is doing, inside NASA, we are building a new uh, crew module, a new uh, crewed vehicle. It's called Orion. And that's being, uh, we're going to have our first flight test on that in 2014. We're, we're going to send it out of low Earth orbit. We're going to send it out and then bring it back in, and it's going to do a reentry test to test some of the protection system, um, you know, the, the, the heat shield so that we can reenter it back into the Earth's atmosphere safely. That's the first test. In 2007, uh, 2017, we're going to do the first unmanned test of uh, this vehicle where we're going to send it around the moon again. Not land on the moon, but send it around the moon into a lunar orbit. And then the plan is in 2021 to do a manned flight of this system around the moon. Um, so along with this new crew capsule, uh, we're also building a new space launch system, SLS. And it's a big rocket, bigger than the Saturn V that went to the moon. Okay, that's, that's going to be our next big heavy lift vehicle. Okay, so that's what NASA is doing, and that's to get out of low Earth orbit, to go back to the moon, asteroids, and to Mars someday. That's going to be the system that gets us there. Now, closer to home and in the short term, we need to get back and forth to the International Space Station. As you've heard everybody say, we're a single string to get there, and we're not only are we single string, we're a single string to the Russians, okay? They've been a great partner, but gosh, we ought to have an American rocket to get Americans to space, don't you think? So that's where guys like uh, yeah. So that's why NASA is providing money to several companies in competition, and uh, Steve now works for one of those companies, that uh, are working on a rocket uh, and a capsule or a, or a vehicle, not just a capsule, but a vehicle to get us back and forth to the International Space Station. And I'll, you know Steve, if you want to. Recuse yourself from that question. So, well, and so there's several commercial companies, and what we're doing is uh, we're, we're we're using what uh, what Mike described as a traditional approach to acquisition of, of systems that NASA is using to get out of low Earth orbit, to to get into low Earth orbit, and and do the space station uh, uh, mission. What they're trying to do is incentivize commercial companies working alongside with commercial companies. In a, in, a, in a competition nature to, and our job is to get to low Earth orbit as fast as we can safely with humans. And so uh, we're working on that. I, 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 uh, I'm uh, working for a company called Sierra Nevada. We're working on a lifting body spacecraft like a mini space shuttle. Uh, there are several other companies. Boeing's working on, a, has a capsule they're working on. SpaceX has a capsule that they're working on. Blue Origin has a capsule they're working on. Excalibur Almaz is one. Who am I missing? I think You're that was. Uh, United Launch Alliance, which are building the rocket there. And our job is to get to low Earth orbit as soon as possible. 
and helps as well. And so the, the idea is work faster, get it done cheaper, turn around costs lower, um, provide that and do that, that work for NASA so NASA can focus their resources on uh, exploration. And, and just to scope it, I think we're looking for in the next five years, we hope to you know, have this kind of a system ready to go and operational. Okay. okay. Uh, well, what I want to say is we had the pleasure of, uh, you know, hearing from Senator Glenn, who obviously is a hero, um, but I, I, I look to these guys also for the dangers that they've put themselves in front of, both in their mil military and NASA careers to fly in space, and uh, that's the real inspiration from my perspective for uh, science and engineering and math. So I want to thank you guys. I want to thank all of you.